Hello, this is John from Forage London and I'm here in my local park in North London. So rather than uh, spending loads of time stuck in front of the computer, for this month's blog I've decided to get out and about. I'm here, my friend Adam's behind the camera. Say hello Adam. Hello. And uh, we're going to look at what's in season and what's available uh, for urban foraging um, around this time of year. So it's late July and it's not the best time of year for foraging in the city. In, in a true sort of hunter-gatherer tradition we should be moving around more. Uh, <coughs> the coast is a great place to be at the moment, salt marshes are good, there's lots of uh, succulent plants, lots of samphire and purslane and things like that. There's lots of good seaweeds and stuff like that. Obviously they're not available to us in London. What is good in London at the moment is the opportunity to learn. Although a lot of the plants that we'll have foraged for throughout the year are not at their best now, they will have become tougher, they will have become uh, <coughs> more bitter, more robust than when we used them earlier on in the year. Um, what we do have is a lot of good ID information on show. So lots of things have now got all of their top leaves, they've got their flowers, they've got some fruit coming through. So it's an excellent opportunity to learn and take some of that knowledge with us through the rest of the year. We're kind of in the, uh, the betwixt and between season, where as I say, the salad plants have reached the point where they're far too tough to even, a lot of them to even use cooked, and what's not come through yet are a lot of the autumn berries, fungi hasn't come through, not that I actually do any, any London fungi anyway, I kind of recommend that if you want to pick uh, good, good, good mushrooms, go to somewhere where the soil quality is guaranteed to be good, go to some, to some decent forest, uh, but get out of the city. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk around, um, Adam's going to film me wittering at the camera in a similar kind of style and uh, we're going to see what we can find. So as they say in TV programmes, let's go. I'm going to do one of those, can I do one of those things where I do a long walking away shot and you speed it up? I was going to insist that you do. Okay, here yeah. we go. So I've found a little spot here where there's quite a few interesting plants to look at. This is often the case, you can walking along, not find anything, six or seven things all seem to be growing all together. <coughs> what we've got here is some common mallow, we've got some swine cress, which is a lovely mustardy little plant. We've got another member of the cabbage family going on here, which is a hedge mustard. We've got some bristly ox tongue, that's more of a survival food than anything. Uh, what else have we got? Over here we've got some wood avens growing which has got an interesting edible root and here, I'd like to say it was growing here but I'm lying, it was growing on the path over there, I already picked it, we've got some pineapple weed. So we're just going to briefly look at all of these, I don't think I'm going to come in and out to the camera and show you specific ID details but we're just going to have a chat about each one. Is that plane making a load of noise? Well there's going to be a plane in this bit of the film because we're in central London and planes go over the top. So this is pineapple weed. This is a, this is a member of the daisy family. <coughs> it's not a native plant. This, um, this escaped from Kew Gardens in 1850 and it hasn't looked back. It's a little bit similar to chamomile and it really thrives in uh, uh, slightly neglected spots. I get uh, chefs and particularly bar people, booze people, phoning me up saying where can I get this and I say go to somewhere where there's like a dirt track and look right in the middle in the most scrubby little neglected bit of land and that's where you get pineapple weed growing. So it looks very much like pineapple, <coughs> um, like chamomile. What's it got going for it? It really smells like pineapple. It smells lovely and you can use it for infusing into drinks and you could use it for flavourings, you can make syrups and sauces and all sorts of things with it. Anything where you wanted something uh, sweet and aromatic. I've not tried making any, any uh, booze, I've not tried brewing with it yet, but I'm sure, it, I'm sure it's got lots of uses. It's very easy to identify. Uh, you need to know roughly what chamomile looks like, which has got lots of frondy, feathery little leaves and then it's pineapple weed and it's got flower which looks like a pineapple. I'm sure you can't see this from where you are, but look online, Google pineapple weed uh, and have a look at that. It's a great little plant currently in a park near you. So that's one thing. I'm going to pop a bit out of my basket. Over here, this is some common mallow. So this is a relative of marshmallow. Uh, it's got very different leaves to, to marshmallow. It's got these lovely sort of five lobed spade like leaves and it's got beautiful little pinky lilac-y flowers 
with five petals on it. Um, all members of the mallow family are edible, so that also includes hibiscus and lots of plants like that. And they also, they contain lots of mucilage, which is a plant fat, it's a lipid. It's there for various reasons, for water storage and things like that. And um, it basically means that when you, you eat plants like this, they're a bit slimy. They're, they've got that same sensation as when you eat okra because the sliminess in okra comes from, from having lots of mucilage in it. So these leaves, you can sweat these leaves and just cook them like a, a spinach or you could make a traditional uh, Arabian soup. It's called, uh, I, I have no idea on the pronunciation, uh, it's called a molokhaya. I'm sure my pronunciation is completely wrong, but that's a spicy Arabian soup, sometimes called a Jews mallow soup with uh, lots of spices and, and lots of young mallow leaves in and you can use the flowers I mean regardless of how the flowers taste which is they taste nice but they look beautiful so they make an amazing decoration for any salad or any wild salad and then it's got beautiful little seed heads that are called cheeses and uh, they contain lots and lots of little seeds that look like they're C-shaped and they all line up together making a little cartwheel and you can fry those, you can dry those, you can use those for cooking. I won't go into any more ID information because we can't get close enough. I don't want to run back and forward to the camera. But common mallow is a plant that is extremely common and uh, all parts of it are edible and worth knowing. So that's another one to go in there. Here's a plant I don't find a lot growing in London parks, but it seems to, to like it here. And this is a lovely peppery little plant called swinecress. Um, it's a member of the cabbage family and it's, it's mustardy. So if you think of the cabbage family as, well not that you would, but I do, if you think of the cabbage family as a straight line, down one end you've got the more sort of bland domestic things like cauliflowers and cabbages and stuff like that. Come in a bit, you've got stuff that's a bit more uh, robust and you've got uh, purple cabbages and kales and things and you start to get more flavour, you get rockets, and you get cresses, mustards, watercress, stuff like that and then right down the other end you get the most fiery stuff like horseradish with that big deep taproot and uh, this is kind of quite down the fiery end really, this is a, what a lovely mustardy cressy plant, it reminds me of uh, when I was a kid in the 70s and everybody on the school coach would have egg and cress sandwiches. Except, as with a lot of wild plants, it lulls you in and then it really gives you a smash in the face because the first taste of this is a lovely peppery cressy thing and then on the back end of it, so right now I'm talking but it feels like I've got a mouthful of wasabi. So that's a, that's a great little wild ingredient and that's called swine cress. Right in front of me, is another member of the cabbage family. This is hedge mustard, grows a, a lot in London parks. It has a three-pointed leaf. Now I know you're not going to be able to see this so I'm going to basically draw the shape of the leaf in the air. It goes out with one lobe like that, up with one lobe like that and out with one lobe like that. So it makes a very distinct inverted T-shape. Um, as with, wow, that swine crest that I ate that was really hot. It's really nice, but it was really hot. Um, as with lots of members of the cabbage, well, as we sorry, all members of the cabbage family. Look, there's somebody I know over there. Hello, Ellie. How you doing? Can't stop. I'm making a film. I'm actually making a film right now. I got to carry on talking. That's all right. See ya. So, as with lots of members of the cabbage family, or I should say, as with all members of the cabbage family. Uh, the old name. Hello, dog. Hello, mister. <laughs> oh, well, we carry on. So, where was I? Right, yeah. All members of the cabbage family, the old, <coughs> the old name for that, for the Brassica family, was the Crucifers. So, identifying them is relatively easy. Every member of that plant family has four petals that are arranged in a cross. Um, and if you if you use that as one of your key ID features, all petals arranged, uh, four petals, white or yellow, arranged in a cross. And the other 
really good ID feature for that plant family. It smells, cressy smells, mustardy smells, cabbagey smells. And also, if I can find a bit here to describe. So there's a nice chap in America called Thomas Elpel, and he's written a book called Botany in a Day. I like anything that you can learn in a day. Obviously you can't really learn the whole topic, but he simplifies a lot of things. And the way he describes the seed heads of all members of the cabbage family are being like a spiral staircase for small people, which basically means the seed heads all stick out and run up the stem in a kind of spiral. And they might be straight, or they might be bobbly, they might have little hearts on the end or balls on the end. But if you've got a plant with yellow or white flowers, four petals arranged in a cross, a cabbagey, mustardy, cressy smell, and seed heads that run up it in this spiral, you're going to be in the cabbage family. And then you've got a hundred plants that you can forage for safely because there's no plants in that plant family that are poisonous. There's a few that are going to taste a bit poor, there's a few that you might not get on well with, but unlike if you were foraging in the carriage fa cabbage, um, carrot family, where if you confuse one carrot for another you could easily kill yourself, if what you thought was cow parsley turned out to be hemlock, you could be dead. When you're back in the cabbage family, if you can make sure that you've ID'd yourself into the right place, there's nothing in there that's going to do you any harm. Uh, what else is here? Bristly ox tongue. This is a member of the daisy family. This is more of a survival food than anything I would have said. It's, um, it's basically it's got bristles all over it. This would be quite an extreme salad plant. Maybe we could make a film called Extreme Salad where into it we put all the things that you can eat but that you wouldn't really want to. Needless to say, it was really rough. It's really spiky, but it is edible, vaguely. And then the last thing I wanted to look at here was this, wood avens. So this is um, it's a member of the rose family. It's got leaves that slightly resemble leaves of a strawberry. So that's a trifoliate leaf. That's three different leaflets. Looks a bit like a strawberry leaf. Now it's not going to produce any edible fruit, but what it does have is it's got an edible root. I've got here, this is what the root of wood avens looks like. If you dig it up, and if you brush it into a little goatee beard so it will fit nicely into a pot. Now another name for this is clove root. And obviously we can't smell this on camera but that's basically what it smells of. It smells strongly of cloves, cinnamon and nutmeg. And this is, if you like, is part of our, uh, what my friend in Scotland, Mark Williams, would call our neglected native spice rack. And that includes all sorts of different plants that for various reasons two waves of the spice trade, modern living, all sorts of things, basically plants that we, we neglect now. But that's a really good plant. It's, it's antiseptic in the same way that clove is, and uh, it's got a really good flavour. So you could make tinctures from it, you could make booze from it. Um, I make an elderberry and clove cordial, which I drink throughout the winter, and I've used clove root in that. It's just a really good, versatile plant. But obviously you can't go digging things up unless you've got the permission of the landowner and you absolutely most definitely don't have the permission of the landowner in a London park. Don't get confused and think because you've got access to an area that you're actually on a common land. It's not. It's private property on which you're, you're granted access. So, so don't go digging things up in your local park. Right, so I think that's tons of stuff to look at here. Uh, we'll go somewhere else. We've got a nice little patch here where we've got three interesting wild and great wild uh, plants to talk about and we've also got a few other bits and pieces that I've picked to look at. We've got some burdock here. This is an amazing plant. It's a, it's a member of the daisy family. Um, the daisy family really includes things that look like daisies, things that look like dandelions and thistles. So your smallest little Bellis perennis lawn daisy right up to the most enormous aggressive looking sort of tropical thistle or cardoon uh, all in the same plant family. Um, as far as I'm concerned, burdock's the bitterest plant <coughs> in the world. Uh, if I even try the tiniest little bit of this, my mouth shrivels up. Um, the top of the plant has got lots of medicinal uses. Um, it's very useful for uh, detox. Uh, it gets the liver function really going, as do, do most bitter herbs. 
gets you uh, producing lots of digestive enzymes, it gets you purging toxicity from your liver into your system, which in combination with a really good diuretic, like say dandelion, which will make you flush that toxicity out, is really good for those kind of things. But I'm not a qualified herbalist, I'm not qualified anything actually. Well, I've got an innkeeper's certificate, so I suppose that means I'm qualified to drink a pub into the ground, but that's, you know, my only formal qualification. The internet has a, an awful lot of information which is regurgitated. So when I do talk about the use of a plant, this is something that I have used personally and I have experience of and I've enjoyed and benefited from the use of that plant. So burdocks, are, like I say, it's a, a, a powerful medicinal plant. What's good about it from a foraging culinary point of view is it's got a root that's really, really amazing and edible. It's got a big tap root on it. Could be this long, could be, could be even longer. Um, it's a biennial, so it lives for two years. So you want to dig the root up, not this time of year because the ground's too hard anyway, but you want to dig that root up in the, uh, in the autumn of its first year or the spring of its second year. When it's not putting all of its energies into making foliage and <coughs> seeds and flowers and things like that, and what you've got there basically is a, a, a long tasty root vegetable which you can fry or you can roast or you can boil all sorts of things want to know how burdock tastes you just got to go and dig some up because it doesn't taste like anything else it, it, it is its own thing um, <clears throat> we've got lots of other things to talk about but I could probably talk about burdock for half an hour because I think it's a, it's a really interesting plant it's got lots of uses edibly and medicinally but we're going to look at this now this is uh, this is one of the plantains so this is uh, another name for these is, is ribwort people prefer well specifically speaking ribwort normally refers to the longer thinner version of this but it's roughly the same plant it's a very easy ID it's got these uh, ribs that run all the way through it so you can just peel through the leaves like that they run uh, straight down the blade of the leaf and this grows absolutely everywhere it grows all over parks and verges and gardens and all sorts of things you have a rosette of leaves on the ground and then you have this flower spike sticking up out the middle and you can use the flower spike you can eat this at the right time of year they taste like little mushrooms this is um this is Plantago Major and it's, um, it's related to the stuff you buy in health shops which they call psyllium husk. And psyllium husk has got absolutely masses of fibre in it as has this and I've recently um, read that one of these seed heads, so basically a teaspoon of plantain husk has got as much fibre in it as an entire bowl of porridge. Um, so I thought it was more of a survival food eating the leaves because they're a bit fibrous. Um, until I saw on a, a, a website called Transitional Gastronomy and they're in the States and they do lots of sort of highfalutin, clever um, sort of Heston Blumenthal-y, science -y things with wild food and they found with this stuff, if you put it into boiling water for just the right amount of time, I think they come up with uh, 3 minutes 37 seconds or something ridiculously precise, which obviously is going to vary depending on what the leaf's like, but there was a point at which it moved from being really fibrous and just before it collapsed it became gelatinous, a bit like seaweed. So I, I tried that and I made a seaweed salad from plantain that I collected in Clissold Park and I mixed in bits of cucumber and sesame seeds and brown rice vinegar and it was really, really good. Um, in medicinal terms it's a brilliant plant if you get cuts or if you go foraging a lot you always get little thorns and things like that in your fingers and this is a drawing herb so my my uh, wife Ellie she said to me when she had a bit of glass caught in her foot she said you're always banging on about plants and their uses what are you going to do about the glass in my foot so I went and got a bit of this from the garden and I chewed it up like this and I made a <laughs> can we cut that bit I made a spit poultice and basically you get a bit of this you put it on you put a plaster on it this is what we did we put some of this on her foot and the following day a piece of glass was gone it had been drawn out by the herb it made the capillaries contract so it helped the wound to cleanse itself it's slightly antiseptic 
and, um, and it's styptic as well. So it had basically closed down the wound, it had sterilised it and it had drawn out of it the thing that was causing the problem. So absolutely amazing little plant. It's one of these, it's, it's a real sort of go-to herb and unlike a lot of things in perhaps herbal medicine where you're looking at treating the whole body rather than treating the condition, this just absolutely does what it says on the tin. You put it on something, it draws anything out of a wound. So that's that's the ribwort plantain or plantain. It's, it's, a, it's a great herb. Um, over here is a bit of this. This is, uh, this is mugwort. The Latin name for this is nice. It's Artemisia vulgaris, named after Artemis or Diana, the goddess of the hunt. And uh, this is related to wormwood. Wormwood's used for making absinthe and it's also used for vermouth and you can use this for making vermouth. Um, traditionally it would have been used for brewing and seasoning. Another thing coming back to that idea of our sort of neglected native spice rack. This is a, a thing that's fallen out of use. Uh, it's quite strong smelling. There's bits of sort of smells of rosemary, eucalyptus, things like that going on there. Also a bit of herb so it would be really good for roasting with meat because the the bitter action will get all of those digestive enzymes going and it will start telling your body to start breaking down the fat in say something like lamb, like you might eat rosemary with lamb for that exact reason. Um, it's good for brewing, I've made a mugwort uh, ale out of it. I actually slightly bottled out and didn't use enough mugwort and I used too much molasses and the next time I make it I'm going to make a really strong mugworty ale. Um, I've also found out recently it's a flavour enhancer. I made a mushroom soup and I put dried mugwort in it and it was the most mushroomy mushroom soup in the world. It was like the volume, the flavour had been turned up to 11. It was really intense flavour. So that's great. Um, it's got lots of other uses. It's a really versatile plant, but we're gonna not dwell on anything in too much detail. Here, and here are a couple of varieties of, let's just for argument's sake call them wild spinach that I've picked. They're in a, a plant family that I can't pronounce, I don't think anybody can. It's Chinopodiceae, but basically it's the goosefoot family or the wild spinach family. This one's called Fat Hen, and this one's called Good King Henry. And when I was at school we studied about a uh, a little guy who'd fallen over in a Neolithic peat bog and he uh, died and was preserved perfectly in his little leather jerkin with his little bag and Fat Hen was his last meal. It didn't kill him, I hasten to add, but this is what he was eating in Neolithic times and here it is growing in exactly the same form in a park in North London, a Neolithic wild spinach. Also pretty much the same species as, as quinoa or quinoa as I like to call it. To, wind up all the people around here. Um, so yes, quinoa, these seeds you can use. I tend not to actually harvest them properly as seeds. I tend to pull them off and uh, uh, steam them, eat them as a slightly crunchy green vegetable. And you've also got the fat hen leaves as well, which you can steam like a spinach. Put them in any kind of uh, Indian cookery, any kind of curry or dish where you might have used spinach. Cook them as a vegetable, make soups out of them. Myriad uses also growing in amongst them, which you often find. I'm not going to go into a lot of ID information about this plant, these plants because it's more like facial recognition. You need to see these plants a lot to become familiar with them in order to be able to identify them safely. And I spot these at sort of 200 yards, more akin to recognising a friend in a crowd of other faces than actually drilling down into the specific botany of them. But what you often find growing with these varieties of wild spinach is this stuff, which is woody nightshade, which is a poisonous member of the potato family. And this contains lots of solanine and acid, which is the green stuff that you get on potatoes that you're supposed to cut out and not eat. Another name for it is bittersweet, and towards the end of its life cycle, when it's producing all these lovely berries, when the berries are ripe, they are supposedly edible because the solanaceous levels drop sufficiently, but I, I tend not to eat them. Identifying it, it's got these lovely 
gothic looking flowers, they're trifoliate flowers, so they've got um, leaves I should say, so they've got three parts to them and they're really spade shaped. It's purple and yellow potato flowers, but the best way to identify this plant, I don't have a bit here that will actually stand up to the test at the moment, but slightly later on in the year or generally when you see this, the berries look like a traffic light. So hanging on the berry there will be a red berry, there will be an amber berry and there will be a green berry. That's a really good way to identify this. What I was going to say is when identifying these plants you need to become very familiar with them and the way that I identify them is more like facial recognition than getting tied into the botany. Um, but you need to be able to do basically what the police would say, eliminate this one from your inquiries, which is the woody nightshade, because this is a poisonous plant and it does like to grow in amongst these others, these wild spinaches. I always find them growing together. So, we've looked at some more plants. I think what we're going to do is perhaps um, look around and just list a few of the other things that are in season without going into detail uh, so we can just have a bit of a summary for some of the other things that are growing in the park at the moment so off we go okay so we're going to have a really quick look at lots of other plants and trees that are in season number one common lime trees or linden trees a delicious edible blossom still some of these left on the tree use them for making syrups and sauces and cordials and I'm making a lime blossom champagne at the moment which should be ready in a couple of weeks. Next! The tree of heaven. No idea if it has any edible or medicinal uses but it's called the tree of heaven. Next! So this is hoary mustard, a member of the cabbage family. Um, it's got leaves that are a bit hairy and not very edible, but it does have good tasty flowers. Warm. 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 That'll do. So this is hazel, and these are hazelnuts. Weight for weight, five times the protein of eggs. A genuine bona fide superfood. Uh, it's pretty hard to uh, eat hazelnuts wild in London without the squirrels beating you to them. So the thing that I do is I wait till the nuts are green and just about to turn brown and I pick them then and they taste like tiny little avocados. Quite a lot of effort but really lovely. Um, over here, elder. Now <clears throat> I could talk about elder, I could get on my soapbox and talk about elder for probably about an hour but Currently we're in the betwixt and between stage with elder where the flower's gone over but the berries haven't really come out yet. So you've got green elderberries. Now these are toxic, however what I do with them is I caper them. So I pick them, these sprays, scrape them off with a fork, put them into a, into a dish or a tub and I salt them. Uh, so smooth salt onto them for about three weeks and then I pickle them in a light vinegar and that detoxifies them and also makes elderberry capers next. So this is Mahonia. I'm not sure if it's Mahonia japonica or Mahonia something or other uh, but in foraging terms once you can identify it down into that bracket all you're really concerned with is that it's got some edible fruit and it's got some edible flowers. This is going to produce these lovely little grapes. They're a little bit tart to eat just sort of straight off the branch but very good for cooking with and sometimes in London they do get to a point where they are sweet enough to eat. And the other great thing about this in December, when nothing else is going on, this will be flowering like a firework display, producing great big beautiful uh, sort of spikes of yellow flowers. And they taste like three different things depending on when you pick them, those flowers. They either taste uh, very sweet, or they taste like tiny little grapefruits, or they taste like shit. And it really depends how lucky you are on what day you hit them on, whether they've been pollinated, all sorts of other things. But these are good as well and also related to a more wild version that's called Oregon Grape. And this is a great uh, uh, park foraging plant because it's been put here intentionally. Park planners love to use this for borders and edges and all sorts of stuff and it provides us with a couple of good sources of food. Next! Okay, we've also got some domestic rose growing here. Uh, we've got lots of different wild roses in the UK field roses, dog roses, wild roses, Japanese rose as well with big rose hips, numerous different uses for rose hips, extremely good for you, masses of antioxidants, uh, tons of vitamin C, uh, weight for weight seven times the vitamin C of oranges, so a bona fide superfood. The only tip that I'd really have is 
if you're going to use rose hips, look at the recipe and reduce the sugar content of the recipe by about 75%, 80% so many of these recipes come from a time before refrigeration and the sugar in there is as a preservative and it's not really necessary now so make things with a lot less sugar don't put them in cutesy kilner jars or bottles and leave them out put them in plastic bottles put them in the freezer they last for absolutely ages and then you can decide how or if you want to sweeten them a bit later on next so this is a silver birch um, what I would do with this is that earlier on in the year, about March time, is I tap the sap from these trees when the sap's rising and I use the sap that I get from it to make a syrup. You have to reduce it an awful lot. In fact, I started with 25 litres of birch sap and I reduced it down to 400 ml of syrup. So that's really not very much. What you need if you wanted to do that would be a whole load of these. These are birch taps or uh, this actually probably is a maple tap because I bought a load of these online and you drill a little hole and bang it into the tree have a bucket and the sap runs across a period of about 24 hours you could gather maybe four to five litres of sap from a good tree it's quite a complicated process and it needs a good bit of information in order to not damage the tree or to possibly damage the tree so if it's something you're going to look at look at it in, in detail and ideally go out with somebody who knows what they're doing don't just like take to the woods with a drill a hammer and, and a bucket full of these uh, silver birch so thanks ever so much for watching this latest installment of my blog i hope it was interesting i hope some of it motivates you to get out there have a look at what's around what's in season what's growing in your local park and i hope to see you on one of my walks soon thanks very much for watching okay and we are rolling. No, you can't be rolling now. This is the bit where I'm cheating. And ready when you are. Okay. This is me cheating. If this footage ever gets out, I'm ruined in this town. <laughs> I'll wait till you've got books for sale at Heathrow Terminal 3. And then I'll release it. <laughs>